This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. This morning, would you please turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter number 20. Jeremiah chapter number 20. I want to bring a message this morning that has a lot to do with why I preach. In fact, I thought about entitling the message, Why I Preach, but I've actually given it a different title. I'll share with you in just a moment. But this morning's message is about preaching itself. You say, well, preacher, I'm not a preacher, so why do I need to hear a message about preaching? Well, the reality is all of us are uh, that attend church anyway are affected or should be affected by the preaching of God's Word. And so there is some value in understanding what preaching is all about and why we do it and what we ought to get out of it and how we ought to approach the preaching of God's Word. So I hope this morning will be one of those messages that's very practical in nature for you as well as it is for the preacher. If you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as I read our text this morning, which is only one verse found in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse number 9. Now this is the prophet Jeremiah speaking And he's speaking at a time where he had been under intense persecution for preaching the Word of God. And believe it or not, there came a point in the prophet Jeremiah's ministry where he said, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm not going to do it anymore. They can just uh, have it on their own. I am not preaching anymore to these people that are ungrateful, unthankful, hard-hearted, won't listen anyway, I'm done. Look what he said, though, in verse number 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart, as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Jeremiah said, I made a promise that I wasn't going to... I wasn't going to preach anymore. I wasn't even going to speak his name to these sorry people anymore. But all the while, while I was trying to be silent, while I was trying to not talk about him, while I was trying to not preach anymore, uh, his word was in my heart as a burning fire in my bones. And I could not help it. It just had to come out. That's what he said. Look again to his very words in verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. He said God's word was as a burning fire shut up in his bones. I want to bring a message to you this morning entitled The Foolishness of Preaching. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning, as we look at your word and read your word, that it will have the effect upon each of us that you desire for it to have. I know that this morning, as with every Sunday, every person listening is in a different place in their own lives, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But I know, too, that you have a way of meeting every need with the same message in a different way. Lord, I pray you do that for each of my folks that are here this morning and those that might be listening afterwards. For it's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. And you may be seated. The foolishness of preaching. Preacher, why do you call preaching foolishness? Well, I'll get to that in just a little while, but that's certainly the way that the world views preaching is is just an act of foolishness. I'm afraid to say that though they may not say it with their mouths, there are a lot of Christians who act like preaching is foolishness to them as well. I want to start this morning, though, by giving you a little bit of background about the prophet Jeremiah. 
He's the one who said that the Word of God was in his heart as a burning fire in his bones. And he just could not help but let it out. He could not help but preach the Word of God even when he promised himself he wasn't going to do it anymore. So, a little bit about the prophet Jeremiah. Well, he's known as the weeping prophet. You may or may not have already known that. Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet. Crying, weeping. He actually is not only the the human author of the book of Jeremiah, but he is also the human author of the book of Lamentations. And the word Lamentations comes from the same root word as the word lament, to lament, which means to weep or to cry or to sorrow. And so why was Jeremiah known as the weeping prophet? Well, he was known as the weeping prophet because in spite of his preaching the word of God, the people of Judah had very little regard for it and it really did not have the impact that it should have had when they heard the word of God preached. He, I'm sure, was like every preacher who's ever preached since, That is, he hoped that when he preached the message of the Lord, that the people listening to the message uh, took it all in, soaked it in, absorbed it like a sponge, and then allowed it to change their lives, allowed it to change the way they live, the way they think, the way they believe. But I'm afraid, like with so many preachers ever since Jeremiah, he got to the point that he felt like, what's the use, Lord? What's the point? I preach and I preach, thus saith the Lord, and these hard-hearted, stiff-necked people aren't affected by it at all. It doesn't change the way they think, the way they feel, the way they believe, or the way they live. Now, I'll be honest with you, as a preacher, we probably all go through that from time to time and feel like what we're doing is, is pointless because so many people don't listen. It doesn't seem to change their lives. But yet, the fact is, it's still the Word of God. Jeremiah made a promise to himself. He wasn't even going to talk about God anymore. Wasn't even going to mention his name. And sure, wasn't going to preach anymore. But he could not help it. It was in his heart as a burning fire in his bones. And he just had to keep preaching, even though he promised himself he wouldn't do it anymore. There's a reason that Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, though. During his ministry, not only did he preach to a bunch of people that didn't want to listen, but when he tried to share the Word of God with them, not only did they not want to listen, they actively worked to stop him from preaching. Let me give you a couple of examples, and if you'll turn over just a few pages to chapter 36 of the book of Jeremiah, I'll show you one of them. You see, Jeremiah lived at a time where Uh, The Lord was about to use Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to conquer Jerusalem, conquer Judah, take the people captive because of their sinfulness and their idolatry. Now the kingdom of Judah is the southern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel had already been captured by the Assyrians and taken out of the land captive many years before this because of their sinfulness. Because of their idolatry. So now when God is dealing with Judah, you would have thought that the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, would have learned their lesson just by watching how God responded to the northern kingdom and their idolatry. But the kingdom of Judah, the people of Judah, they were no different than you and I today. They were no different than a lot of Christians today. Yes, some of them listened to the Word of God, but the vast majority of the people in the southern kingdom of Judah were still in rebellion against God. They had turned their backs on Him, and they were indifferent at best, and many had pursued the false gods of idolatry away from the true and living God. These are the descendants of the people who came out of Egypt and saw God part the Waters of the Red Sea. These are the descendants of those who for a generation wandered in the desert and saw God feed them every morning with manna, free food on the ground, and every evening God brought a flock of quail into the camp 
for them to have fried chicken for supper. I mean, these are the descendants of the people that saw God bring water out of a rock in the middle of the desert to give uh, water to three million thirsty people. Their fathers had seen this. These are the descendants of those people. And yet they had become indifferent toward the Lord. They had in some cases completely turned their backs on Him. Were worshiping false gods, false goddesses. And now God is about to bring judgment upon them because of their sin. And yet they were the worst way off you could be when not only are you in sin and God's about to bring judgment because of that sin, but their hearts were so hard that even when the preacher of God said, listen, judgment is at the door, they still wouldn't repent. They still were stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and refused to repent. I know that we look back on these stories of the Israelites in the Old Testament many times, and we say, how in the world could they be so cold and indifferent and and hard-hearted after seeing all that God had done for them? But you know, in reality, Christians today aren't much different. At least those who profess Christ, there are still many who have seen God do wondrous things in their own lives, in their own families, in their own church, and, and yet they too, even when God is trying to get them to turn back to Him, to repent of things in their lives that aren't right. And God gets uh, right up to the very, uh, the very edge of bringing judgment. And even today, there are Christians who still won't change their course, won't change the way they're walking, no matter what the preacher preaches, no matter how many times they read it for themselves in the Bible, they just aren't going to change. That's the situation it was in which Jeremiah found himself preaching to the people of Judah. Now look with me there in Jeremiah 36, verse 27 and 28. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after that the king had burned the roll... And the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. Preacher, what what in the world is this talking about a roll, and King Jehoiakim burning it, and Jeremiah having to get another roll? Well, let me tell you just briefly what had happened. This book of Jeremiah that you have in your Bible, this is the second time Jeremiah uh, quoted it and uh, Baruch the scribe sat down and wrote it as he quoted it to him. And this was the second time this book of Jeremiah was written down. The one you have in your Bible is the second time it was given by God through Jeremiah and written down. Well, what happened to it the first time, preacher? Well, the first time... The entire book of Jeremiah was written as God gave it to Jeremiah and Jeremiah dictated it to Baruch the scribe to write down. And when it was totally finished, King Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, the king of those hard-hearted people, had the roll or the scroll, as you and I would call it, taken. Now, how long is the book of Jeremiah? Well, it's one of the longest books in the Bible. The king took that. After all the work that went into it, and all that God had put into it for Judah, King Jehoiakim had that scroll taken and just thrown in the fireplace. Burned it up. So God told Jeremiah, okay, sit down and write it again. Sit down, dictate it to Baruch, and have him write it all out, just like I gave it to you the first time. So what you and I have in our Bibles is the second time that the book of Jeremiah was written. Because not only did the people of Judah not appreciate God giving His Word to them, trying to tell them what was about to happen, but even the king didn't appreciate it. The king himself had no regard for the Word of God. Boy, that sounds a lot like America today, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like that crowd up in Washington, D.C., 
uh, the American people not, might not have the regard for God that they ought to have, but that crowd in Washington has even less regard for God than what they ought to have. And the Bible says that the king himself had the entire book of Jeremiah that was written, the words of God, thrown in the fire. Now, never mind that it was uh, Jeremiah the prophet that had dictated those words, and Baruch the scribe that wrote them down. They were the word of God. And it was a message from God specifically to King Jehoiakim and the people of Judah. It was for them. You know, that's a pretty bad thing to realize that I've got a message from God specifically for me and for me to have no more regard than to take it, wad it up, and throw it in the fire. That's what King Jehoiakim had done. Imagine how Jeremiah must have felt seeing the king throw the words of God with so much time, tears, uh, and and, and toil put into it, thrown into the word of uh, throw, throwing the word of God into the fire, with no regard whatsoever for it. Kind of gives you an idea why he might have been a weeping prophet, the people he was dealing with. But if that wasn't bad enough, Jeremiah kept on preaching, and he rewrote the book of Jeremiah, which is why you and I have it. He wrote the book of Lamentations, uh, but. Look what happened because he kept preaching even after the king threw the book of Jeremiah in the fire. Look over, if you would, two more chapters to chapter 38 of Jeremiah. In chapter 38, verse 6, it says, Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchia, the son of Hamalek, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords, and in the dungeon... There was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Because of preaching the word of God, they took Jeremiah and they took him to this dungeon. And in this particular dungeon, they had, they had one particular cell, if you want to call it that, in the middle of the dungeon. Uh, it was really nothing but a, a well that had been dug but there was no water in the well, just a bunch of mud down at the bottom of it. And they took Jeremiah, tied ropes to him, and let him down in there and left him in the bottom of that cistern where the mud was. And the Bible said he sank into the mud. And it doesn't tell us how deeply he sank into the mud, but whether it was just up to his ankles or up to his knees or up to his waist or maybe up to his shoulders, here he was in a pit of mud and no way to even get out. No food down there, no water down there, no way to get out of there, stuck in the mud. That's what they thought of the preacher who was preaching the Word of God. You say, well, preacher, at, at least that's not going on in America today, at least preachers aren't being thrown down in a, a well and left in the mud to die. No, but that's what they were going to do to Jeremiah. Now, the story continues and God gets him up out of there, but that, that, was, that was who he was preaching to. That was the group of people that he was giving the message to directly from God, and they had no more regard for not the preacher, but the words of God than to throw the preacher delivering it down in the muddy, muddy pit. Now, that's one thing not to like the preacher. But when you take the word of God and wad it up and throw it in the fire, and you take the preacher who's delivering the message, who's preaching the word of God, and you throw him down in a muddy pit... That doesn't say much for the crowd of people that he was preaching to. But you know, that's the way a lot of Christians re respond to the preaching of God's Word today. Now, I'm very blessed here at Pinnacle Baptist Church. You all don't uh, have never thrown the preacher down in a muddy cistern and left me there. Uh, you've never, as far as I know, taken a copy of the Bible and thrown it in the fireplace to burn it up. But there are lots of churches around us where Christians may not be physically doing those things, but they might as well be doing those things. Because they're paying no more attention to the preaching of God's Word, or God's Word itself, than what the kingdom of Judah was doing in the preaching in the days of Jeremiah. 
you know, it's a sad thing. And, you know, lest we let ourselves off the hook and say, well, the preacher's just preaching about those other churches today and other Christians today and Israelites today, you know, maybe you and I ought to be a little more careful too. You know, maybe, maybe we ought to think to ourselves for a moment when we hear the Word of God preached or we hear the Word of God taught and we take it in, we know what it says, do we apply it? Do we take those areas of our lives that are not in conformity to the Word of God and do we let it start sanding off those rough edges like it ought to? Or do we say, ooh, that's uncomfortable and we just push it off to the side? just like the kingdom of Judah did. We ought to take the Word of God when we heard it preached, and we ought to say, how should this impact me? What effect should this have on me? In our Bible study, in Sunday school, we're going through the book of Acts. We're hearing a lot of Paul's testimony about his work for the Lord in sharing the gospel of Christ. But it's not just a story to, to read a story about the apostle Paul. Every time we study it, we ought to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, out of the chapter today, what is there for me? What is the practical application for my life? How should it be affecting my life? That's what we're supposed to do with preaching, and then we're supposed to let it affect our lives in that area. But how many Christians, they, they go to church on Sunday morning, they sit through the preacher preaching, they're glad when it's over, and they never even try to do the hard part of asking themselves, okay, Lord, what, what is the message for me today? How does this actually apply to my life, Lord? What do you want me to get out of it, Lord? You see, it, it takes work to be an active participant in the preaching of God's Word when you're sitting listening to the preacher. I know that the preacher is active because I'm up here moving around, I'm talking, I'm doing all those things. But there are too many Christians that think that their only responsibility when they go to church on Sunday is to sit in the pew, uh, listen as best they can while they try to keep their eyes open, and just try to get in a little bit of what's being said. But no, that's not your responsibility sitting in the pew. And when I'm the one sitting in the pew, like I was at our men's fellowship the other night with another preacher here, uh, we are supposed to be active participants in the preaching of the Word of God. That is, we're supposed to be hanging on every word and asking God at every sentence, okay, Lord, what is it that the preacher is saying that you're wanting me to get out of this? Because I assure you, when the preacher starts on Monday, asking God, Lord, what do you want me to preach on Sunday, a week from now, I assure you the preacher is not just up speaking on something because it's what he wants to talk about. Uh, the preacher, uh, at least this preacher, asks God every week, Lord, what do you want me to preach on next Sunday? Lord, give something to me so that it's fresh in my life so that I can then turn around and pour it out for them to receive it and hopefully get something fresh from you for their own lives. It's an active participation on the preacher's part, but it's also supposed to be an active participation on the hearer's part. But how many times do we come to church and we just sit there and we just struggle to stay awake? We stayed up too late on Saturday. We did all the things on Saturday we like to do, and Sunday's just a time to take a nap and recuperate a little bit from Saturday. I know you hopefully don't view it that way, but too many Christians do. Do we get up on Sunday morning fresh, awake, excited about what God has for that morning when we get to the Lord's house and sit there in the pew, Lord, I'm waiting. What do you have for me, Lord? Okay, I got that point, Lord. Is there something else I need to get out of this too? And we sit there hoping God gives us something and we're looking for it, we're, we're watching for it. That's the way we should respond to preaching. But I think of old Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He preached about the, the fact that Judah was going to be taken captive by Babylon 
And they were. And he preached that because of their idolatry, because of their sin, they were going to be taken into exile and held captive by Babylon for 70 years before God would let them come back to the land. Now, this is not my message this morning, but I kind of think the reason God sent them into captivity in Babylon is because if you go back and look at all the gods and goddesses they were worshiping with the pagans around them, all those false gods they were worshiping were Babylonian gods. They had originated in Babylon and been brought over to the land of Canaan, but there was the Babylonian religion. I think God ironically was saying, okay, if you want to worship Babylon, I'm going to send you to Babylon, and you can spend the next 70 years sitting in your room thinking about it in Babylon before I let you come back to the land. Because their hearts were already in Babylon, God sent them to Babylon. I believe that with all my heart. But here's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He didn't want to see his own countrymen go into captivity for 70 years. He was trying to deliver a message of repent, but they would not hear it. You know, I thought about some other prophets and preachers in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I thought about what were the things that moved them, that motivated them to preach the Word of God. Now, here you have Jeremiah saying, I I tried not to preach it, and it was just in my heart as a a burning fire in my bones, and it just was going to come out one way or the other. But I thought about some other preachers in the Bible, and what the Bible says moved them, made them continue preaching the Word of God. I, I won't read all these passages. You can jot them down if you want to, and go back and read them later, but... Uh, In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, verse 30, we have the motive or the motivation for Ezekiel. Ezekiel talks about God looking for some men of Israel to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. That is, fill in the holes that weren't being filled and share the message of God with your fellow countrymen. Protect your countrymen. Uh, uh, compassion for those that were receiving the message. I think for Ezekiel, a big part of what motivated him was a compassion for the lost all around him. I don't think you can read the book of Ezekiel without seeing not only God's compassion for the lost, but Ezekiel's compassion and passion for the lost. Dear friends, we, we all ought to have a greater compassion for the lost around us. And when we think about the fact that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, that every lost person who dies is going to hell for eternity, we ought to be moved with compassion for the lost. I think Ezekiel is a good example of a preacher who was moved with that compassion for the lost that he saw all around him. And then I think about the Apostle Paul. Paul, in Romans chapter 10, verse 1, tells us uh, that it was his love for his countrymen that made him continue preaching, even when they didn't want to hear it. He said, oh, that, uh, that, that his own countrymen would be saved. Paul even said something that this preacher will never say, uh, but he loved his own countrymen so much Paul said he would, that all of Israel would be saved. He would even give up his own salvation if all of his fellow countrymen would be saved. Folks, that's quite a statement to make. Your preacher can't say, I'm selfless enough to say that. I'm sorry, but I I wouldn't give up my own salvation even for all of my countrymen. But Paul said that. It was one of the things that weighed so heavily on him And it's the reason that even though they tried to stone him on multiple occasions to death, he continued to share the gospel with his own countrymen who hated him for it. It was his love for his countrymen that caused Paul to continue to preach. That was his motivation, or one of them. I think about uh, Isaiah in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah. 
In Isaiah chapter 6, the first nine verses, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Isaiah goes on in those next few verses to describe him seeing himself as the, the unholy, impure sinner that he is in the sight of a holy God. Isaiah saw the holiness of God and his desire to please a holy God. And that's what motivated the prophet Isaiah. No, I'm okay. Thank you, brother. Oh, that you and I would see ourselves the way Isaiah saw himself as undone, impure, unholy before a holy living God and to realize that our God is telling us the same thing He told Isaiah, go and speak for me. That's what He's told every one of us in the New Testament. Prophet or preacher or not, we ought to be motivated just like Isaiah. We're so undone. We're so unholy. But to think that the holy God of heaven wants me and you to speak for Him. That's what motivated Isaiah. He says it with his own words. Now I think about David in the Old Testament. I think it was at least in part David's, not only his love for God, but his love for the Word of God. David tells us in Psalm 119 in numerous places, but especially verse 103, it was his love for the Word of God that motivated him to keep telling others about the Lord. Then there's Jonah in the Old Testament. Jonah was the reluctant preacher. He did not want to go preach to the Assyrians in Nineveh. He wanted God to just destroy Nineveh and all those enemies of Israel. But God said, no, I want them to repent also. I want them to have a chance to repent as well. You know how Jonah ran from God? God had him swallowed up by a great big whale. And yes, it was a whale. I know that uh, in the book of Jonah it says a great big fish. But when Jesus told the story in the New Testament, Jesus said Jonah was swallowed by a whale. So if Jesus said it was a whale, it was a whale of a fish, but it was a whale. Jonah got swallowed by a whale. Spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, which is a picture of Jesus spending three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then that whale of a fish spit him up on the shore, and he decided, you know what? I think I'm going to go to Nineveh and preach now. What? Because he wanted to preach. He still, after preaching, wasn't happy that God had sent him there, and he sat up on the hillside, just to watch God go ahead and destroy the city anyway. He still was a reluctant preacher, but he preached out of a sense of duty, out of obedience to God, because he had found out firsthand what happens when you're not obedient to God. So he preached reluctantly out of a sense of duty and obedience. Folks, you may not want to witness for the Lord. You might not have the compassion for others you ought to have, but you still ought to witness to the lost around us because it's your duty. It's obedience to God. I hope that you and I have the compassion for the lost we ought to have. The love for our fellow countrymen that we ought to have. The love for the Word of God that we ought to have to want to share it. But whether we have those things yet the way they ought to be in my heart, I still have to witness to those around me of the Glorious grace of God because it's my duty. Whether I feel like it or not. Whether you feel like it or not. Whether you're overcome with compassion for the lost or not. You're still supposed to be sharing the glorious grace of God with everyone around us. And so am I. So there are preachers in the Bible in both the Old and the New Testament who preach the Word of God for different reasons, different motivations, but they did what God said to do. The preaching. But you know, when you think about preaching, it it almost seems 
like a silly exercise. I mean, anyone can sit down and read this book for themselves. Can they not? Anyone that wants to and has a copy can sit down and read it for themselves. So why do you need a preacher? In fact, I've heard people say that I don't need to go to church and I don't need a preacher. I can read the Bible just fine for myself. And you know what? I praise the Lord for people that do sit down and read the Bible for themselves. All of us should sit down and read the Bible for ourselves every day. So then why preaching? Why do I need a preacher? What's the preacher supposed to do that I can't do for myself? Well, in Nehemiah chapter 8, the Bible tells us what preaching is supposed to be. This was after the people had gathered there in Israel. They had rebuilt the, the walls of Jerusalem after returning from captivity for 70 years in Babylon. And they rebuilt or were rebuilding the very city of Jerusalem itself. But they found a copy of the Word of God that had been left in Jerusalem 70 years before. All the people gathered that day outside to hear the Word of God read. The Bible says that Ezra the scribe took to the, took to the, uh, the platform they had made to the pulpit and the Bible said, when the people saw the book of the Lord open, they all stood with one accord. And we do that for the reading of God's Word here every Sunday, but why did the people stand? Nobody told them to stand. They stood because of the awe and the respect they had for the Word of God. And then the Bible says, Ezra and the scribes read out of the book of the Lord. So, yeah, anybody can read the Bible, for themselves. But then guess what it says? In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, it says that Ezra and the scribes, they read in the book of the law and gave the sense of the meaning. You see, the preacher's job is not just to stand up here and read the verses out of the Bible to you. Now, yes, the preacher is going to read some Scripture but then the job of the preacher is to help you make sense of what you just read. What you just heard read. The preacher is the one that God says, Okay, I want you studying that book so that after you read that text to the people on Sunday, you can help them understand more easily what it's saying. What I intend for them. What it means to their personal life. You see, the preacher is the one who's supposed to take the Word of God that was written, in some cases, 2,000, 3,000 years ago and help you know how to take it and apply it to your everyday life after it's read. It's not just to be a history book. It's to be a book that affects us daily. That's the preacher's job. The Bible says that it's the foolishness of preaching that God uses to save people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, listen to what the Apostle Paul said, beginning in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I say the foolishness of preaching because Paul calls it the foolishness of preaching, but he says it's foolish only to those that believe not. It's to the lost crowd that preaching is foolish. 
I've known more than a few Christians who thought going to the preaching was foolish too. At least that's what their behavior says because they never went to hear the preaching, though they claim to be a Christian. But Paul says it's only foolish to those that believe not. To us who are saved, it's not foolish at all. It's how we came to the cross. It's how we became saved through the foolishness of the preaching of the cross. And it's not just, it's not just salvation that is brought about by the preaching of God's Word. There's a whole lot more in this book than just those things about how to be saved. There are things for every practical part of my life. So maybe to the lost person, it's foolishness. But to those that love God, the preaching of God's Word and the preaching of the cross is anything but foolishness. You know, God could have chosen to preach to each of us in a number of different ways. Other than using the preaching like the preacher does it out of the Word of God. In fact, I can think of a couple of, well, comical ways God delivered some messages in the Bible. I can remember one instance where God used an old red rooster to preach a message. Remember when uh, Jesus was being taken in the middle of the night, that illegal trial that was held for Jesus, and uh, Jesus had told Peter at the Last Supper, by the way, it wasn't the last dinner, it was the Last Supper, uh, Jesus told him, uh, before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me how many times? Thrice. Three times. The first time, Peter denied the Lord that night, and then he just moved on. The second time, he denied the Lord that night, and he just moved on. But early, early, about the time the sun was coming up, Peter denied the Lord a third time the same night, and it was at that precise moment that a great big old red rooster somewhere crowed to announce the new day was breaking. God reminded Peter of the words of Christ by an old rooster crowing. God delivered a sermon through the beak of a red rooster. You say, preacher, how do you know he was a red rooster? I don't know that, but I think red roosters are the prettiest roosters, so I said a red rooster. But that rooster preached a sermon that morning, and maybe nobody else got the sense of it, and understood the meaning of it, but I promise you, Peter understood the sermon that was preached by that rooster that morning. I think of a time in the Old Testament where there was a supposed preacher, a supposed prophet, who was riding a donkey, and the donkey had more spiritual sense than the preacher riding him on the back, and the, the donkey saw the angel standing in the way with a flaming sword and wasn't going any further, even when the preacher didn't have enough spiritual sense to know not to go any further because he was doing something wrong, headed the wrong direction, and that old donkey stopped, stopped in his tracks, wouldn't go any further, and the Bible says uh, the 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 prophet began to beat the donkey and finally the donkey's mouth opened and she spoke to the prophet and the prophet heard the words being spoken by a donkey of his errors, his ways that were not right with God. He got preached to by a donkey. Now, Brother Lawrence, I don't want any jokes after church this morning about uh, our preacher uh, being a donkey uh, I, I, we, our church has a, a donkey delivering the messages. But that prophet heard a sermon that was preached that day from the mouth of a donkey. God's used some interesting ways to get sermons delivered in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and God has a way of getting His message across, however He has to do it. But God, in His divine wisdom, has chosen not the wisdom of this world of how to do things. Not the purpose-driven life book way to do things. Not the Fortune 500 way to do things. But God's 
wisdom, which is the foolishness of preaching. To give the meaning, to give the sense of it, so that we might apply it to our lives. The preacher ought not take lightly his responsibility of preaching the Word of God. But anyone sitting in the pew ought not take lightly our responsibility of receiving the message from the preaching of the Word of God. I hope this is to you as practical a message as it was this week to the preacher when God gave it to me. When I was 19 years old, Right out of high school, I, I'm, I'm almost positive it was January of my first year in college. I had just graduated high school. I was in my first year of college, and our youth pastor gave me uh, an invitation to come preach to the teenagers on a Wednesday night. Now, I've already told this story before. Y'all know the story. Our teenagers met in the, the uh, upstairs of the, the gymnasium building we had back then. We had a, a youth room up there. And every Wednesday night, the teenagers went up there and the adults went down to the sanctuary for the adult service. And every week, the youth pastor would preach to the teenagers. We'd sing and play games, do other fun stuff, and then we'd go downstairs and play basketball. But that particular week, our youth pastor offered me the opportunity to preach to the teenagers. Now, I'm... Still a teenager myself. I'm 19 years old. TR, I knew all of these teenagers. They're the ones I grew up with. Still went downstairs and played basketball with them after church every week too. They're my friends. They're my peers. But the youth pastor gave me an opportunity to preach. I've never preached before. I've never even given a testimony before. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a clue. And I said, well, can I, can, can I give you an answer Sunday night when he asked me if I'd like to do it on Wednesday? I said, can I give you an answer Wednesday night? He said, yeah, yeah, just let me know one way or the other. And I went home and I began to pray. And I said, Lord, I don't know why he's asked me to do this. I'm not a preacher. I've never done this before in my life. They all know me. They're all my friends they're not going to listen to anything I say anyway. Lord, what, what do you want me to say to him? What do, I, what do you want me to tell him? And I do not in any way feel that I was called to pastor at that moment. I certainly didn't feel called to pastor at that moment. That was years and years and years before I ever felt God called me to pastor. I did not feel called to pastor but I knew that God was telling me as clear as day. It doesn't matter if you're called to be a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary or not. I'm giving you an opportunity to share your testimony and say something out of my word that could change somebody else's life. Brother Alex, I felt like God was saying, listen, I'm giving you this opportunity I wouldn't be giving you the opportunity if I didn't want you to do it. And I felt like from that day to this day, Miss Mary, that any time God gives me the opportunity to teach or preach or share the Word of God, if I don't do it, I don't know that He's going to give me another opportunity. So from that day, when I was 19 years old, to this day, Brother John, there's never, to the best of my recollection, been a single time that God gave me an open door to teach or preach or give my testimony that I said no. Because I have always been terrified since that day when I was 19 that if I ever said no, T.R., I was afraid that if I said no, he wouldn't ask me again. I don't mean the youth pastor. I mean the Lord. And to the best of my recollection, this preacher, since I was 19 years old, has never said no to an invitation to preach the Word of God or teach the Word of God or share my testimony about the Word of God. I did not feel called to preach back then, but I just knew as a Christian, 
it was my obligation to do whatever I could to share the Word of God whenever there was an opportunity to do so. By the way, it was years and years later before I ever felt called to pastor. And by the time I did feel called to pastor, I had already preached hundreds of times in a wide variety of different scenarios and situations. I had preached in children's church hundreds of times. I had preached in the jail ministry. I had preached in uh, uh, nursing homes. I had preached in uh, rescue missions downtown. I had preached in churches, even though I was not called to preach or didn't feel like I was called to preach. There were some small churches that when they didn't have a preacher, they would call my pastor and say, hey, we need somebody to fill in. We don't have a preacher right now. Could you get somebody to just come out and take a turn preaching on Wednesday night or Sunday night? And uh, my pastor had a list of men in the church, and I was one of them. He'd say, yeah, I'll send somebody over there. And uh, he would say, Ray, I want you to go preach at this little church on thus and such a night. And uh, I didn't feel called to preach, but I didn't say no because I was always afraid God would not give me an opportunity if I said no one time. So I had preached hundreds of times in different settings before God ever called me to pastor, at least before I ever felt called to pastor, because the preaching of the Word of God is so important. I can relate somewhat to all those different preachers in the Bible that I mentioned and their motivations for preaching, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I feel, I think more like Jeremiah than I feel like any of the rest of them that I talked about this morning. Because Jeremiah, he didn't feel like he could not do it. Even when he tried to not do it, he couldn't. I have such a burning desire to share the truth of God's Word. I'm going to be honest with you. I love being your pastor, and I'm glad you're all here today. And I hope next week some of those that are not here this morning will be back and we'll have them here too. And I hope some of those visitors that told me they were going to be here this morning will be here with us next week too. But whether they are or aren't, and whether you are or aren't, if there's just me and one other person shows up next week, I'm still going to get up here and preach the message God gave me to preach. Because I... I feel like I have no choice but to do that. I think I feel like the prophet Jeremiah. I just feel like I would just sit here and be consumed in a fire or explode if I tried to keep it bottled up and didn't preach. Let out the, tr the truth, the message God gave me to preach. I'll close with this illustration. The Protestant Reformation started, as you know, with Martin Luther there in Germany. He spent a couple of years in hiding with a bunch of Anabaptists, by the way, who were around before the Protestants. But when he finally agreed to, to come before the, the Catholic Council and debate the Catholic spokesman over the 95 theses he had nailed on the door in Wittenberg, I don't know why this is doing this. Giving me some feedback. I'll, maybe it's because I'm too close to that mic. But Martin, uh, Martin Luther, after hearing the Catholic theologian go through his arguments, and giving his own arguments as to why he believed the Bible said what he did, the Catholic Church issued an ultimatum. He could either stop preaching salvation by grace through faith like he was preaching, like he learned from the Anabaptists, the Waldenses in Wittenberg, or he could have a mark put on his head. The words that Martin Luther are reported to have said, I think are wonderful words. He is reported to have said, here I stand, I can do no other. In other words, I can't help but do what God's called me to do. I'm going to preach the truth. It's the only thing I know to do. Here I stand, I can do no other.
Oh, that this preacher would say the same thing. But not just the preacher. Oh, that every Christian who names the name of Christ and claims to love the God of this book and the book of this God would say the same thing. Here I stand, I can do no other. I wonder if you've reached that point in your Christian life. Where no matter what the world says, what persecution comes against you or against all of us, you're going to continue to share Christ openly, unashamedly, come what may. Here I stand. I can do no other. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed? Miss Mary, if you'll come and prepare to play a hymn of invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that all of us that are here today Not just the preacher, but all of us would have the same commitment to sharing the truth of your word that these men of God in Scripture had. And Lord, that whether we're the ones standing up doing the preaching of God's word or whether we're sitting in the pew that day listening to the word of God being preached, I pray we would all take an active active participation in seeking what your word is for us, how to apply it to our lives, and then sharing it with others outside these four walls. Lord, help each of us to view our role and our responsibility with a sense of duty, obligation, but also tempered with love and compassion for the lost. And to view ourselves as Isaiah did before the presence of a holy God. How else could we do any other than be the bold witnesses you've called us to be? Lord, to those of us who are saved, it's not the foolishness of preaching. Help us to proclaim you Proclaim your word with a boldness, a love, a compassion, and a sense of duty to a holy God. We ask these in Jesus' name. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed as you stand where you are, Miss Mary, if you'll begin to play. Dear friend, are you here this morning? You say, preacher, I, I, I've just not thought about the sense of duty I have to a holy God to be doing more than I've been doing in sharing the gospel. Or maybe you'd say, Preacher, I I already knew that, and I used to do that. But I haven't been. Preacher, it's been too long. If that's you, dear friend, perhaps the message was for you this morning. If that wasn't the part of the message that was for you, some part of the message was for you this morning. There's no one here, including the preacher, that there wasn't some part of this message for you today. What part was for you? Would you glean it from what was said? Would you ask the Lord how to apply it in your own life? Would you make a commitment to Him this morning to do that very thing and to apply it to your own life?